All right, on today's webinar, we're gonna be talking about equity waterfall structures as it relates to apartment syndication. And we're also gonna to touch a little bit on the equity waterfall structures and what it means, what's the difference really between an equity waterfall versus maybe a capital stack. Cause I know there are some, there is some confusion with that and where, and what position you should be in the capital stock as stack as well. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about what are equity waterfalls. And then we're also gonna talk about the three most common types of equity waterfalls. Um, these, these three most common types of equity waterfall structures. And then uh, we're also going to be talking about maybe which equity waterfall that you maybe should use in your next deal. Okay. Um, somebody's mentioned it on here. Where's my hacks? I usually have a passiveinvesting.com hat on. I actually have a meeting at one o'clock uh, with my pastor at our, at our church. He's a new pastor. So I want to sit down and have a meeting with him. So I'm actually not wearing my hat today. So I uh, decided to wear a little bit uh, nicer attire, if you will, since uh, I'll be meeting with him. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why, Frenchie, I don't have my hat on today. So <laughs> uh, glad you noticed, though. All right. So let's talk about these equity waterfalls, right? So these equity waterfalls, well, one thing that I forgot to do is mention who I was. I know a lot of you on here know who I am, but for those of you who maybe this is your first time, because we do have a lot of new people, usually about 30 to 40% of the people that are attending these webinars each week are new people that have never heard about us before. So I'm this gentleman right here, uh, Dan Hanford. I'm the founder of this multifamily investor nation group. I'm also one of the managing partners for this group here called passiveinvesting.com. And, uh, and you can go to this website and the, the meet the team section. You can find my name and um, a person, my name and picture right here. You can click on that. And then you can, there's also a video here to learn a little bit more about me and my background. Um, I'm located here in Columbia, South Carolina. I have four children, all under 10. I have three girls and a boy. So I have a nine-year-old girl, an eight-year-old boy, a four-year-old. She just turned four uh, last week, a four-year-old girl and a, and a two-year-old girl. So uh, definitely busy in the Hanford household there, uh, but you can find out more information about me here. If you're interested in joining us on one of our, our, one of our next opportunities, you can actually click on this button here, uh, join the Passive Investing club. And, uh, and when, you, when you click on that form, you'll be able to fill out, when you click on that button, you'll be able to fill out this form here that allows you to join the Passive Investing Club. So we are right now only accepting accredited investors. And so if you don't know what that means, um, uh, an accredited investor usually meets one of two criteria. There has some, been some expansion on this definition of an accredited investor, which I'm not going to get into today. But the two primary reasons, primary ways you can become an accredited investor is you have a million dollars of net worth that does not include your primary residence. Or you can have, and you can meet the income requirements, which means you make at least two hundred thousand dollars a year if you're single, or three hundred thousand dollars if you are married uh, and filing jointly. And you have had that for the last two years, and you have a reasonable expectation for that to continue. So, um, if you're interested in joining us on one of our future opportunities, we'd love to have you. Uh, we actually have a deal that we'll be releasing uh, uh, pretty very soon, so likely next week or the following, um, and it'll be open to accredited investors only. So I will be making that announcement about that deal to the group. So if you want to join us on our webinar, kind of see what that opportunity is like, you can certainly do that as well. So with all that said, let's dive back into this topic here of what are equity waterfalls. Um, the equity waterfalls that uh, are in a project are sometimes confused with capital stacks. And so I'm going to first, we, I know we've had prior webinars on capital stacks, but I want to do this particular one uh, with, a, with a whiteboard presentation so you can actually see what it is like. So let me get my uh, whiteboard up here. So here is my whiteboard. And I got to shorten this thing up just a little bit so I can, oops. So hopefully you guys can see my board on the screen now. And uh, as I said before, I'm not the best artist, if you will, but I uh, feel like this is a good, this would be a good illustration so you can actually see what this is like. And so I'm going to get this thing a little bit larger. That's a little bit too large. Uh, let's try this one. Yes, that'll actually be perfect. All right. So there, there's, there's two different styles of, not two different, different styles, but there's the equity waterfalls and the equity waterfalls look like this, okay? So an equity waterfall, and the way I kind of think about it is, is, is if you think about it of a series of buckets, right? They, they start at the top and they go to the bottom. So if we have a bucket right here, right? And we have this bucket, this is the top of the bucket and we have money, you know, right? We're just gonna do, we're just gonna say we have money here and we're gonna put this money into this bucket right? Well, once this bucket fills up with money, okay, it's going to now overflow. 
And so when that money overflows, it's going to go into the next bucket, right? So, and then again, as that money is continuing to overflow from that bucket and go into this bucket, it's going to overflow and go into the next bucket. And this is what they call a waterfall. So it's similar to like if you were to have three buckets in a row here and you had water being poured in there, you would have the water going down underneath the next bucket and the next bucket as it started to fill up. And that's the, 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 a classic illustration as to what a waterfall is, right? Um, and I know one of you just mentioned on here, are there going to be slides available? We're going to be sending out a recording to this, but I do not have any slides I'm going to be providing to you after, um, on the webinar today. Um, but this is what that looks like, okay? And we're going to talk about a few different structures so you can actually see what that looks like as well. Um, but this is going to be, like I said, this is going to be a waterfall, right? This is a classic kind of waterfall illustration. Um, as to what that's like. Now, a capital stack is, is different. So you can see here, this waterfall is built from the top down. So like this might be your debt, right? So you're gonna have to pay off your debt first when you get proceeds from a sale. And then you might have some preferred equity. We're not talking about preferred return right here, just preferred equity person, right? Have a preferred equity person. And then of course, you're gonna have your common equity down here, right? Now, this is actually flip-flopped in a capital stack. And so in, in any type of stack, right, it's always built from the bottom up. Like you never built a Lego stack from building, starting from the top and then building it down, right? Um, it's always you put the block down at the bottom and you build up on top of that. And that's what a capital stack does is it's built from the bottom up. So this in a capital stack, well, usually, let's just do this. Usually you're gonna have this, this huge stack like this, right? And it's gonna be stacked one on top of the other. The majority of this is going to be the debt. So we're just going to call this the, the debt, if you will, on a project. And then up over here, you might have a small sliver for your preferred equity, right? And then you're going to have another slice up here for, that's actually not a very good level place to put that one, probably more like here. This is going to be your common equity right here. And then you're going to have your, uh, your GP equity up here, right? We're just going to call this GP equity, all right? And so the priority here is actually that the debt gets the top, the highest priority, right? And then as you go up, the actual priority starts to go down. So your prior, when you're paying off, paying it off, the debt gets paid first, then the prior, the preferred equity, then the common equity, and then this GP equity. Also, if you look at this, the level of risk also goes up as you go up this particular level as well, which is why the debt usually has a lower interest rate. So you're going to have usually between about right, right now we're at like two and a half percent. So let's just say right now we're at two or 3% interest rate because of where we are right now in the market. You know, that could obviously change, but two to 3% private equity going to be probably closer to about, you know, seven to 10%, you know, depending on which deal it is. And you're going to have your common equity, which is going to have an opportunity to be able to be higher than that. So we'll just say 10% plus, because it's going to participate in the upside usually. And then you're going to have this GP equity, which is usually just dependent upon on how, how good the deal, how, how, how well the deal performs over the life of the deal. But you can see that in any type of an investment, the higher the return you have, the higher the risk, the lower the return, the lower the risk. And it's the same thing here. The debt has the lowest risk, so it gets paid the least amount of money. Then you have a little bit higher up, gets paid lower or a little bit higher, and then even higher on the common equity. And then of course, this one is obviously the, the, the GP, if, depending on what they put inside the deal, is going to obviously uh, be dependent upon how well the, the project performs. They could have a pretty significant return because they're going to usually have higher returns because they're getting more sweat equity into the deal versus just money. So, but at the same time, this, this is the highest risk to be in, then this, then this one, then this one. So once you actually understand that capital stack structure, you can understand kind of where you should really be as far as priorities and risk levels inside of that capital stack. So that's the two differences between what a waterfall is and a capital stack, okay? Uh, now somebody was asking here, what is the typical range for a, a GP? Well, so the way we structure our deals, when we invest, we actually invest in these deals alongside our investors. So we actually invest in the common equity piece here. So technically the GP shares is, is not necessarily infinite, but I mean, it technically is because the GP is not technically putting any money up for that GP percentage, right? Um, so when, when you're trying to calculate an actual percentage return, it's really kind of hard and hard to calculate that, right? Because they're not putting any money in the GP shares. Now, 
most people will still, and I encourage you to only invest with the groups that do put money into the deal. So usually our group is between about five to 10% of the initial equity we're going to be putting up, but it's going to be for common equity shares alongside of our investors and not for our own shares um, itself. So good question there. All right. So does that make sense to you, everybody? So for those of you who are on, raise your hand if you understand this and it make, it's making sense to you. It's clicking and, and you, you, you understand. All right. Um, good, good. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So the next question I want to ask you is, is prior to this webinar, how many of you did not really have a full understanding of this? So I know I just took like probably five to 10 minutes in the beginning to really kind of explain this, but I think it's a good base, right? It's a good base to have underneath your belt to really fully understand and grasp this, I guess, concept between what a waterfall is and what a, a capital stack is. Good, good, awesome. Thank you guys for doing that as well. And so I'm gonna uh, bring up a different screen here. Let me see if I can get out of this. Um, new share. We'll go back to this other page and uh, talk about these different structures. So we have a couple of different illustrations I'm going to show you. Uh, there's three, um, you know, common types, if you will, for uh, these, these waterfall structures. So I'm going to show you a very basic one first. So this basic one is going to be pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and uh, let's see. Let me see if I can share my screen again. Um, I'm going to go over this one that has really kind of three buckets. This is a pretty standard one. You've seen this before. This is kind of a bell. I have, you know, Melissa on our team who helps me with these illustrations because as you can see, I'm not that very good, not that good trying to draw with a mouse and, uh, and be very artistic. So uh, you can see here that this is the LP 100%. They're going to get in this particular, you know, example, they're going to have a 7% preferred return. And that's going to, and this is what they call a, so when I say that there's three different types of waterfall structures in each deal, there are uh, three different types of waterfall structures. For example, you're going to have a cash flow and you might want to write some of this stuff down. You're going to have a cash flow waterfall where during the life of the deal, the cash flows that are being generated off the property, what's the, the waterfall related to that, to the cash flows. The second is going to be a refinance or a supplemental loan or what we call a uh, a, a capital event type of, um, of waterfall. And then a lot of times it's different for the exit waterfall, which is again, is still another capital event, but it's an exit water, waterfall, right? Where when you sell the deal and you're going full cycle with it, what are you going to do in actual with all the proceeds once the, the deal has been completely sold off, right? How are those cash flows going to be distributed? And so this right here is going to be for the, it's going to be a typical LP waterfall structure for a single tier equity structure for the LPs, right? And so you're going to have the LPs, you can see there, they're bringing in 100%. Let me see if I can get my annotator up here. It makes it a little bit easier uh, when I'm doing this. So you can actually see, there you go. So you can see my, uh, my little red dot here. So the LP is a 100%. That means they put up 100% of the equity and they're going to be getting this 7% preferred return, right? So this first bucket is actually the bucket that's going to, when the cash flows come in from the very beginning, they're going to be filling up this bucket to meet that 7% preferred return. And so once that 7% preferred return bucket has been filled up, that extra cash is going to overflow into this next bucket. And this bucket you can see is going to be uh, the equity splits. So 70% of the cash flows are going to go to the LP, 30% are going to go to the GP. Now, for those of you who are new and you don't know what LP is, that's limited partners, right? Or your passive investors in the project. The GP is going to be the general partner or the operator, the main person who is, who is, who is putting this deal together. So they usually get a, a piece of the, of the deal or of the profits to be able to uh, manage that particular project. So they're going to get 70% of the cash flows going to the LPs, 30% is going to you as the GP if you're the one putting it together. And then once that fills up, there is what normally you might actually only see uh, this right here, right? There's these two, right? Well, in our projects, we also do a secondary waterfall, I mean, hurdle in the waterfall. That's another term that we have not brought up yet is what is a hurdle within the waterfall? So if you look at this example here, each bucket would have a line underneath it, right? Which kind of would be that hurdle, if you will, right? And so once you get that hurdle, once you actually hit that hurdle, meaning this, once you hit the 7% preferred return, 
the next hurdle here would take into to a, would, t- would come into play, which means there's going to be a change in the bucket to now f- overflow into the next bucket, which is going to be 70 30 split. And then the next wa- uh, hurdle in the waterfall will be at, underneath that next bucket. And then that's going to change from 50 50. Now, I didn't explain at what point does it actually go to 50 50, but typically in a hurdle, you will have a performance target there. So it will say that the target will be uh, so that it will it, and it will say that the target uh, will be like a, like a certain IRR or an annualized return. Once that particular target is hit, then the, then the equity splits. And what that does is it continues to, to further incentivize the GP to continue to outperform the property because they know if they can outperform the property, then they're going to get a higher end uh, of the a higher piece of the pie at the end, right? Um, typically in our projects, we'll put together a equity waterfall structure where the secondary, I mean, the, the, that secondary hurdle there is when the uh, the originally projected returns get met or close to that. So it's usually between about 13 to 15% IRR is where we're going to hit. And then that equity changes from 70-30 to 50-50. So that's a typical waterfall structure that you're going to see for that, what I call a cash flow waterfall. Now, this next one that I'm going to show you is also one that you will likely see. And this one is going to be one that's going to, I'm only going to have one illustration for the, uh, the, 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 the refinance or supplemental loan uh, waterfall and the exit waterfall, because in our situation with our projects, it's the same right? And so you will see this. Now, they, again, both of these illustrations are working off of a single tier investment structure. And what I mean by that is that you have one class of shares for your investors, and that's it. We've talked about in prior webinars about the dual tiered structure, which um, is a common now, has been commonly used to, you know, uh, you have like a preferred equity piece in there, plus a common equity piece. The so you would basically have uh, a different, you have more waterfall, more buckets underneath there. And I didn't want to get it too complicated, right? Obviously you can get it as complicated as you want. Um, but for this particular illustration and purpose, I wanted to make it pretty simple. So this would be an illustration of one of a capital event or when you sell, right? When you sell the asset, what's going to happen with the proceeds? So first off, what's going to happen is you're going to see that if there is any unpaid preferred return to the limited partners, that money's going to first flow into there. Now, obviously, these waterfalls that I'm showing you are for this particular one is not taking you into account paying back the debt right? So this waterfall would not kick in until the debt was already paid. So debt gets paid first. So that would actually be on top of this. And once they, the, that gets paid, it'll roll over into this one. And so if there were, if there was any unpaid preferred return, meaning in our, on our, our projects, we do a, um, uh, we do a, 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 a cumulative preferred return. I mean, if we don't hit the preferred return one year, it rolls over to the next year, right? And it just continues to add up until the cash flows pay it back or until we actually sell and the investors get caught up. So the LP uh, is going to get their 7% preferred return that if, if they hadn't already received it, right? But once whatever the remaining amount was there, it's going to roll over into the return on their initial investment. So, whatever amount of money they put in. So if they put in $100,000, they're going to get that preferred return first in this first bucket. And then that second bucket is they're going to get that $100,000 back um, from that, from the, from the proceeds. And then once all the investors are paid money, all the investors money is paid back, then it's going to roll over to the next project here or the next bucket here, which is going to be this next hurdle where they're going to now split the profits 70% to the LP and 30% to the GP. Now, even after that one, there's another one, which is that next, which is that, that, that hurdle that would allow the LP to be able to get that 50-50 uh, split if they hit those performance metrics. So that's the typical waterfall you're going to see, but you're going to have that preferred return get paid back first, any unpaid preferred return, and then any unreturned capital contributions would get paid back um, second, and that's right here. And then after that, then you're going to get that profit split 70 30 and then after that you'll get that 50 50 split as well um when that when you have that 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 that, that you know uh, last hurdle there for a performance hurdle so those are the illustrations i want to um, open it up now to any questions because i know there's going to probably be questions already one of them is in here about uh what type of deal or circumstance do you incorporate these waterfall distributions 
Um, and I would say, I'll answer that in just a moment, actually. So the last question in here is, is which equity waterfall should you use in your next deal? I would say you need to use all three of them, right? Because every deal is going to have these three waterfalls in them, right? You're going to have a cash flow waterfall, which you, which basically is telling your investors, hey, when the cash flows are coming in every month, what's going to happen to them after all the expenses and the debt is paid? Who's going to get those cash flows? And that's what that waterfall is. Now, you don't usually have an illustration like this to the investors. Um, it's usually written out inside of the PPM documents and the operating agreement about how those cash flows are going to be distributed. First, it's going to be this. Second, it's going to be this. Third, it's going to this. Fourth, it's going to this. Fifth, it's going to that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then same thing with the capital event or where there would be a, a refinance, a supplemental loan, or when you sell the asset, you're going to use that, this waterfall that you're seeing right here on your screen. So let me bring it back to this screen here and open it up to some questions here. So Jonathan's asking a question here, do GPs not typically participate proportionally in the preferred return? So um, it depends. So some deals have what they call a true preferred return, which the true preferred return is basically stating that as a LP, you're going to get 100% of the cash flows to that, that, that preferred return, and then everything else is split 70, 30, 80, 20, whatever, however your equity splits are set up. And there are some projects that are, have a peri pursue, peri pursue type of preferred return where that they have a catch up, right? And it can sometimes be a yearly catch up or it can be quarterly, monthly, but usually you'll either see yearly or at the end of the deal and the GPs will catch up to where the LPs were. Um, and so they're really, at the end of the day, really wasn't a preferred return at all, right? That's kind of how that's actually set up, except for if the deal went south and there wasn't enough money, then they would at least get, have that first 7% because it wouldn't be anything else to give to the GPs. It usually is a little bit hard to make deals work when you do a catch up like that. So most people will work off of a true preferred return where the investor is going to get 100% up to 7% and then everything after that would split uh, based on that waterfall. But good question there. Let's see. So I think I answered, John, I answered your question about, you know, what type of deal or circumstance do you incorporate these waterfall distributions? So any type of syndication project or deal, you're going to incorporate all three of these into it um, so that your investors know how you're going to handle uh, the distributions or the, the, uh, the proceeds from one of those capital events. Let's see. So uh, I don't, so Gregory is asking about an, an example of, um, of, of, a, of an actual example of some various waterfalls. So the waterfalls that I showed you are, are actually examples from some of the projects that we have actually done ourselves. Um, they're just kind of outlined in a general format. Uh, and so I don't necessarily have like a, 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 an example to give you of a full cycle deal that shows you know, exactly what happened in each one of these waterfalls. But as an investor, it's good to understand how that's going to work so that you can plug in your $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 investment, whatever it is, and you can see what returns you're going to get at each one of the, one of the stages inside of a waterfall as, as well. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. So at what point do you transition from bucket three to four? So that's going to be the, your, your, as the operator and the GP, you will have a better understanding of what that means because... Uh, or not, excuse me, as, an, as a passive investor, you'll have a better understanding of what that means because inside of the PPMs, it will tell you at what point does the 70-30 split go to 50-50. And that would be those performance metrics. So in our projects, we usually have it around 13 to 15%, somewhere around there on an IRR basis. So if as we're distributing the funds, when we sell, if we hit that 13% IRR hurdle, then that means that's when that equity split is going to, ch going to change from 70-30 to 50-50 and it starts to roll over into that next bucket. But you can change that for you if you're you know, doing a different deal or whatever, you can change those numbers however you want. Just remember, the, the, more, the, 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 the lower that number is, the less likelihood you might have some investors that might want to invest because if you have a 7% preferred return and they get 70-30 you know, split up until 9% and then you split 50-50, then you might not get as many investors in that, right? Um, but we, we do it so we can make sure our investors get their, their return first, and then we, we can change that performance hurdle if we overperform the property, right? And that's kind of what I, we like to call it is a performance-based hurdle in there. Let's see here. Double, yeah, some great questions coming in here. We've got about five more minutes, then I'll take some questions, and then uh, I'm going to have to uh, wrap it up today. Let me take a quick swig of water here. 
Got a big old gallon jug there. So trying to drink a lot of water. And there's a lot of questions. Let's see here. Let's see here. Um, does the waterfall apply only to the sale of a property or can it be used for cash flow distributions? Uh, I answered that one. So the answer is yes. You'll have two different waterfalls, one for the sale of the property and one for cash flow distributions. Let's see. I know the difference. The issue is how to negotiate the percentages. Um, I'm not sure what the question there is, Frenchie. What is the, the average breakdown, percentage breakdown of capital among the different buckets of your investments? So typically you're going to have 100% of the equity is going to be brought in from the LPs. Obviously, as the GP, we're going to bring in 5 to 10%, but we're going to be putting it in the bucket with the LPs. We're investing alongside of our investors. And so that is going to be uh, 100% there. Um, that is the LPs are going to be bringing. And then the breakdown of capital, if we do a, two, a dual tiered structure where we have a a preferred equity slice and then a common equity slice for a, like a class A and a class B investment structure for our investors, then we'll usually have the, the preferred equity piece is about at about 25 to 35% of the capital stack, sometimes a little bit less, but mostly not, not usually any more than about 35%. Um, and so that's kind of how we, we break down the percentages in, in regards to the capital itself. Obviously the, 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 the deal itself is the, the debt's gonna be bringing in between about 65 to 75% of, the, of, the, of the, the purchase price of the property too. Do your investors agree to a, compute, a cumulative preferred return prior to making their investment? Yes, Jim, they do. So uh, the, you're basically in your documents that you're gonna to send to them for that, for what we call the PPM, the private placement memorandum that your investors will review, you will, you will explain to them that you have a cumulative preferred return. Now, if you don't wanna do that, you can do a non-cumulative preferred return, but um, investors are usually fairly sophisticated to understand that that basically means if I don't hit it one, one year, it just goes away, right? Um, and so we actually make sure that we, we, we do that I and mean, give them that cumulative preferred return. Um, so Josh asks, what software can be used to build this out on a live deal? So usually these types of waterfalls aren't usually illustrated like this. And when you're, when you have a live deal, usually it's going to be you and your attorney sitting down and you're telling him exactly or her what you want the waterfall to look like. And they'll write it out in words. So we'll usually say, you know, first, this is going to happen. Second, this is going to happen. Third, this is going to happen. And it's going to be, say, and it'll always say like, and then, and then, and then. And so that your investors can read through that to understand what it's going to look like. What factors determine the percentages? Um, and I'm not really sure what the questions are. The uh, question is, are these structures required to be securities registered? So uh, I would say yes. Like, like these are typical structures that are going to be registered with the SEC. So there's obviously some exemptions available, 506B, 506C, and inside of Regulation D are what we usually use for these. Uh, we typically are, we're now actually moving to a 506C type of, of investment structure um, starting on our next project. And we'll be doing that moving forward, which is why we can only accept accredited investors from our projects. Um, but, you know, you definitely want to do some research on that. On our YouTube channel, if you search for, uh, if you search, let me see if I can just type this in here. I just click on our YouTube channel here. Um, on our, if you're on our YouTube channel, you can actually see that you can type in, securities and you probably have a video on there that'll show up. There's multifamily syndication, SEC regulations, regulation A versus regulation D. So you can go on there. This is actually a regular, uh, uh, an SEC attorney that I had on and we, we kind of broke it down between the two. So you can also see there's another one here, SEC regulations for apartment syndications with uh, Dugan Kelly. So Dugan Kelly was on with this one. So you can just click on those and see them. I will copy this one if you want to take a look at this one here a little bit closer, Vincent, so you can see that one. That one's the one on this SEC regulations. But there's a lot of good videos on here, and you can just type in the chat, not in the chat, but in that search box and box uh, and and find out a lot about that search box is right there. But to find a lot about this, I'd love for you to subscribe. So um, I'll take I'll take this and type it into the chat box as well if you want to uh, subscribe to our. YouTube channel. would love to have you on there. We post a lot of videos on there, a lot of good content. So you can continue to follow us. So you can feel free to do that. Next question here. Do you see these waterfall situations 
work better with new developments or buying existing properties. They work for both, Eric. I mean, you can, these have to be inside of a deal for both because um, even though a new development is not going to have a lot of cash flow, eventually as you're leasing up that property, there's going to be cash flows there. So you got to figure out how, what you're going to do with those cash flows. Um, and then you're going to obviously have the capital event when you actually refinance that thing or when you sell it. So you're going to have to know, the investors are going to have to know exactly what you're going to do with that property. So, uh, you know, hopefully that answered that question there. When a hurdle is involved, say 15% IRR following a refi event, is the remaining equity used as the hurdle or is the original amount of equity used? Is the remaining amount? So uh, it depends. You can set it up both ways. And I think, Russell, what you're asking is, is the unreturned initial capital, right? So if uh, you have a uh, $100,000 investment and you've had two capital events, the first capital event re returned 20% back to investors. So they got $20,000 of their $100,000 back. And that would mean that they now have their unreturned capital contribution of $80,000. So that preferred return or that hurdle is going to be based off of that um, instead, right? Um, but the the actual IRR though, that would be more for like the calculation of, of the preferred return. But from an IRR perspective, it's it's always usually based off of, at least in our investments, off the original equity amount. So when we have a capital event, we don't dilute our investors and try to remove them out of our properties. Um, if we have an investor that comes in and spends a hundred, not spends, but invests a hundred thousand dollars and they get a uh, 5% stake or whatever the stake is, and they, we have a capital event and we reduce them down, them down to, you know, they get a hundred thousand dollars back and they have zero invested capital because they gave that originally, originally they're still going to have 5% of equity in that particular deal. So that IRR is based off of of the entire pro process of them receiving cash flows and at what point throughout the deal, as well as proceeds from a capital event as well. Could you explain the difference between preferred and common equity? What causes, co what's causing the increased risk? So preferred equity is going to be lower in that capital stack, okay? And so if you're lower in the capital stack, because you have lower, lower in the capital stack, you have lower risk, meaning that all the cash flows and all the proceeds from sale will go to, to return money to those investors first in the preferred equity slice. And so the reason why it's lower risk is because they actually get paid first before the class B investor or that next or that common equity investor investor, right? So they have to get paid first. And so usually what you're going to see is, is those preferred returns are usually between about, you know, eight, nine, 10%. So they're not going to be as high, but there won't be any participation in the upside. So even though they get higher cash flows during the hold period, and when you sell, you'll be able to get that back too, then uh, you, you are, you are not, it's not a guarantee, but it's as close to a guarantee as those preferred equity investors can get, especially because it's only 25 to 35% of the capital stack. Now, once you start to go above that, when you start to get like 45, 50, 60% of preferred equity, the risks are not really there, right? I mean, not really uh, lowered at that point because you have more people in class A that you have to hit before, you know, you go into class B. So technically, you would be better off to go into a project that had in between that 25 to 35% of the capital stack being preferred equity, but it's as pretty much as guarantee as possible because if it is not a guarantee, so don't get me wrong here, but um, if you have a deal that's starting to go south, you'd have to go really far south for them not to be able to pay any money to, to the common equity investors and, 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 and then, you didn't, then the common, then the preferred equity investors starting to lose money or starting to not get a return. So it's a safer investment overall. You just start giving up some of the up, upside potential of the project to be able to have that lower risk investment. Well, you guys have a lot of other questions in here. Um, I'm, I'm coming up right against the clock. I have one minute before I have to get off. So I do apologize for not being able to get to each one of your questions. Um, but I, I do appreciate each one of you being on here. Uh, we had uh, quite a few of you on here, which was kind of exciting to see. This is a topic that we don't normally see, you know, hear about a lot. Um, but right here, you can see on the screen, this is going to be the next topic for next Thursday. It's a, quite, a question that I get quite a lot about how do you make money as an apartment syndicator? So we're going to talk about this. So if you're interested as a passive investor to learn how syndicators make money, we're going to talk about that. But if you're um, somebody who is active and want to learn how to get into the space, we're going to talk about what fees do apartment syndicators charge and what kind of equity splits are you, should you be asking for? And should a syndicator need to invest their own money? And then uh, which fees should you charge to keep your investment? investing with you time and time again. So we're going to talk about each one of those things on the webinar. And so let me give you a link if you would like. For those of you who are already on, you can go ahead and register for this webinar for next week. Um, this link is going to be something that you can just uh, do right now. 
Um, I just noticed that these links that I gave you earlier, I gave to all panelists, not everybody. So let me give you the links to uh, the, the YouTube video on securities there and then a link to our YouTube channel. So you can just easily click on that and, uh, and jump on. So sorry about uh, not giving you those earlier. I didn't realize that I was not pressing the right button there, uh, but you can certainly go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, but go to this page if you'd like and register for our next webinar for next Thursday at 12 p.m. I want to thank each one of you for being here. Uh, time and time again, you guys show up and I love it. Uh, it's, a great, it's good to have a good audience each and, each and every week and looking forward to seeing you next week. So hope you have a good rest of your day and, uh, and we'll see you here next week.